Well, all right, let's get started. I'd like to introduce the chairman and founder of Integra Life Sciences Corporation. We're honored to have him with us here this morning. Last year at this time, he was sitting where you are, looking forward to meeting and getting to know his fellow entrepreneurs and attending the awards presentation. The excitement mounted when he was named the national winner in the health services category, health sciences, excuse me. And later, he was announced the overall National Entrepreneur of the Year for 2006. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a really terrific guy, Dr. Richard Caruso. Good morning, everyone. You know, even though it's pretty early in the morning, it's still really very exciting for me to be here. And because you're here, I'm going to try to make the entrepreneurial investment each of you made by getting up and taking the time to come and listen to me worthwhile. Being involved in the Entrepreneur of the Year program this past year has caused me to give a lot of thought to my 13-year adolescent business career, which I started when I was nine years old, and my 42-year adult business career, which I started when I was 21. These thoughts first helped me understand where I am in my life, and in retrospect, how quickly time goes by. They also raised many questions for me, mostly the same questions I've been asking myself my entire career. For this morning's presentation, I've identified five of these questions pertaining to entrepreneurs, and I'm going to share with you my self-defined answer to each of these questions as I personally experience them. I do think many of you will be asking yourselves the same questions over the next few days and coming up with your own answers. First question, what is an entrepreneur? Now, because we're all here for this event, you might think that we all have the answer to this question. In my mind, it's not that easy. I started Integra Life Sciences 18 years ago in 1989. Before that, I already experienced 24 years of what I now understand was a continuous adult entrepreneurial career in many unrelated industries. These include large asset creative finance, national commercial real estate, a national steakhouse restaurant chain, reorganization of a steel company, alternative energy, and others. During that time, I really resisted being labeled as an entrepreneur. I felt that entrepreneurs were blind, foolhardy risk takers, and that's not how I saw myself. I thought of myself as a prudent, risk-controlled, hard-working business decision maker. My resistance changed after I came to the realization that what I was really doing was pursuing my personal dreams. And the more passionate I was about something, the more I would underestimate or ignore at least some of the actual risk of what I was pursuing. In most cases, I was able to successfully take and circumvent these risks, and as a result, I became more confident I could navigate through the unknown future. I also came to understand that once I did well in a particular venture, I was willing to assume more unknown risk in the next venture. Early in my adult business career, I was really fortunate to have achieved my personal financial independence. After this, I then realized that even though all my entrepreneurial ventures were for profit, that the commercial success of a new venture was in and of itself the most critically important component for me. While I do not want to imply that making money was not important, I came to understand that my personal financial reward for initiating a successful business venture was more like a recognition trophy for doing a successful job rather than my personal financial project objective. During the early years of my career, I often wondered how I wound up where I was doing what I was doing. I realized early on that I probably would never survive working in a bureaucratic organization where I'd have to give up my personal liberty, my passion to pursue my dreams, and my innovative thinking. By personal liberty, I mean the freedom and the opportunity to create my dreams, to think innovative thoughts, and to develop the passion to pursue them. A cornerstone of my understanding now is that to be an entrepreneur, the ability to have and express personal liberty needs to be practiced. In fact, to be an entrepreneur, the ability to dream and to pursue your dreams 
needs to be exercised first as a personal way of life. I came to understand that my dreams and innovative life started at an early age, quite frankly, because I'm first generation American. I'm the son of immigrant parents from Italy. My father was a waiter and a craftsman. My mother was a housewife. Certainly, my parents loved me and took care of all my survival needs, such as my health, food, and clothing. However, neither of my parents had any real expectations for me beyond my finishing high school. Before I was a teenager, I took control of my life by selling newspapers on the beach and shining shoes outside nightclubs in Atlantic City, New Jersey, to earn my own money for things I wanted to have, like a bicycle, ice cream cones, water ice, and hoagies, for myself and my friends. At that early age, even though I thought I didn't understand it, I recognized the importance of my personal liberty. Then I had to figure out how to use it to define and plan my life for myself. I finished high school, went to college on a football scholarship, and then to graduate school on a fellowship and teaching assistantship. This life education of how I grew up inspired me to hang on to the individual freedom I was born with and to develop a creative and innovative approach to my entire life. I now understand this growing up life experience to be a very important part of my education and the development of my individual entrepreneurial spirit. I believe that while entrepreneurship is most often related to business, true entrepreneurs are first individuals who liberate themselves, who develop a personal entrepreneurial spirit, and foremost, become the entrepreneur of the enterprise of their own life. From my experience, it is only then that an individual can apply this spirit to something else, such as a business venture, a professional or academic career, or their personal or family life. So, my answer to this first question is, you must become the entrepreneur of the enterprise of your own life before you can use entrepreneurship in anything else you do, including a business. Question number two. Are individuals born or educated to be entrepreneurs? We hear this question a lot, and everyone has their own view. I believe that no matter where we are born, that at the moment of birth, we are all born with personal liberty and with the foundation for entrepreneurship. However, no matter where we are born, we are helpless from our birth to take advantage of this entrepreneurial foundation, in large part because of the people who love and care about us and because of our governments, our school systems, and others who want to control us and plan our lives for us. Certainly, education in any form can help us identify, understand, and take advantage of the personal liberty we need to engage the entrepreneurial potential with which we are born. The challenge each of us has is to keep that liberty as we grow, turn it into an entrepreneurial spirit, and define our lives for ourselves. Therefore, my answer to question number two is, we are all born as entrepreneurs with personal liberty. However, education in any form, including formal education and the education of our personal life experiences, can be important ways of helping us to keep the entrepreneur we were born as and to further develop our entrepreneurial spirit. Question number three, what is a serial entrepreneur? I think we've all heard this expression. Because we are here this morning at breakfast time, some of us might think of an athlete whose picture is on a Wheaties box as a serial entrepreneur. That's a different kind of serial than what we're currently thinking of. I'm relatively sure that most of us think of serial entrepreneurs in the context of someone who starts a business, then goes off and starts another, and then another. In this context, the word serial implies repetitive acts as opposed to a continuous daily way of life. For me, entrepreneurship is not something you turn on and off. So as you might suspect because of my two previous answers, I believe the answer to question number three is, true entrepreneurs are not serial. I believe they are systemic. True entrepreneurship is an individual and personal way of life that is applied to all aspects of an entrepreneur's life no matter who they are or what they do. Now question number four. What is mentoring and what role does it play in entrepreneurship? 
once I figured out how entrepreneurship applied to me, I started to accept being called an entrepreneur. I then realized it doesn't mean taking senseless risks. I started to understand the importance of my dream, my passion to pursue them, and the mentors and mentoring resources I was able to naturally engage to assist me in pursuing my dreams. This process is not senseless risk. As a matter of fact, it's somewhat of an organized plan which is activated when an individual decides to pursue their dreams. For me, this realization became a proper understanding of how mentoring actually works, which I think is misunderstood and often mischaracterized in our society, and which I think is critically important to an individual's personal development and the substance and development of an entrepreneurial spirit. In 1986, I started the Uncommon Individual Foundation to encourage individuals to engage in what I call open system mentoring and to create their personal mentor sphere. Unlike a top-down, one-to-one, mentor-to-protege, subservient, open system or relationship, open system mentoring puts the responsibility with the protege to become the leader of their mentoring relationship and to systematically engage necessary mentoring resources in the passionate pursuit of their dreams. Here, individuals are encouraged to discover and release the uncommon individual they were when they were born and which continues to reside within them but which may have been suppressed or imprisoned from early in their lives. It was during the time I started the Uncommon Individual Foundation that I understood that while I had achieved financial independence and others thought I was successful, I did not yet really feel personally successful merely because I made money. I realized that to feel personally successful, I had to define success for myself. Using the research I did in starting the Uncommon Individual Foundation, I felt I discovered the importance of my dreams and naturally occurring mentoring in assisting me to get to where I was in life. I decided to engage my mentor sphere, in effect, several necessary mentoring resources to develop the criteria I needed to identify so I could personally successful feel as if the next dream I created and the next venture I started would help me achieve personal success. The nine criteria I identified are as follows. Do something intellectually challenging. Work with leading edge technology. Work with people I like and respect and who respect me. Work on something that will benefit mankind. Solve problems on a personal basis for my fellow man. Accomplish something important that hasn't been done before. Create a vision that others can understand and follow. Create interesting career opportunities for others. And then, if all the above happens, make money. Please note that number nine, make money, while critically important for our investors, stakeholders, and the success of the company, was not really my individual objective, but rather for me personally, a trophy type result for achieving numbers one through eight successfully. To pursue my dream of getting on the road to my personal success, I decided to start a medical company. At the time, I thought this was the best industry opportunity I had to satisfy all of my nine criteria. So in 1989, I began what is now Integra Life Sciences Corporation. At that time, the national press ran a lot of stories of how medicine started the practice of removing body parts from cadavers and transplanting them in the needy patients. With Integra, I wanted to find a way to have the human body regenerate its own parts. When I started Integra Life Sciences, I had no medical background, and to even have an opportunity to be successful, I had to find and engage several project-focused mentoring resources, in effect, a venture mentor sphere. Seven years later, by engaging the assistance of my personal and venture mentor spheres, Integra introduced the first FDA-approved product to market to regenerate the largest body organ, skin for severely burned patients. This product introduction confirmed that Integra Life Sciences and its associates had envisioned and then created regenerative medicine as a new branch of medicine. In 1996, this first regenerative product was also named by the Food and Drug Administration as the notable breakthrough device of the year. Once Integra achieved this incredible milestone, I thought the company's success would be assured. Boy, was I wrong. I didn't understand the third-party reimbursement system, 
the statistics that indicate that many burn victims are uninsured, or the problems of product marketing in the healthcare industry. Fortunately, I was able to engage Integra's venture and mentor sphere and attract an industry experienced management team, and most importantly, an industry knowledgeable chief executive officer, Stuart Essig, who shared my vision of building a successful medical company in the new field of regenerative medicine that Integra created. Today, Integra Life Sciences have several regenerative and other products on the market. We have annual revenues approaching 600 million and adjusted annual profits approaching 50 million. We have over 2,000 associates and we do business in over 100 countries. Integra really is a wonderful company of which I'm very proud. However, from my perspective, while the financial results are critically important for all of our stakeholders, including me, the greatest reward and feeling of success I have is when we at Integra Life Sciences get thank you notes and letters from patients whose lives were saved by using our products. Previously, I mentioned that at the Uncommon Individual Foundation, we understand mentoring in a way where the protege is the leader of the relationship. In a mentor sphere, what makes the mentoring relationship active is the protege's dream, their passion to pursue it, and their potential to systematically engage multiple mentoring resources to accomplish it. This creates a personal mentoring culture and facilitates the development of an individual's personal entrepreneurial spirit. Because we believe in this, a portion of the Uncommon Individual Foundation's web platform is constructed to function as a virtual mentor where each individual can come to the site and create their own mind mentor sphere. Creating one's own mentoring environment is essential to nurturing one's personal liberty, building one's personal entrepreneurial spirit, and pursuing one's dreams. Certainly, this is reflected in my career and in the founding of Integra Life Sciences. Therefore, from my perspective, my answer to question number four is, Mentoring in its original and most natural form, and as encouraged by the Uncommon Individual Foundation, is essential to engaging the mentoring resources which are necessary to form, focus, and develop one's dreams and the passion to pursue them. Question number five. What is the difference between an entrepreneur and a leader? I believe an entrepreneur is a leader, and a successful leader needs to have an entrepreneurial spirit. There's substantial overlapping between entrepreneurs and leaders. Actually, they can be the same person. The difference between them is that an entrepreneur starting a venture generally needs to fill many roles simultaneously and take personal hands-on operational control of the startup venture. As their venture starts to grow, many entrepreneurs find it difficult to engage entrepreneurially spirited leaders to join them to release their day-to-day -day control of the venture and to delegate roles and aspects of leadership responsibility to others. True leaders, on the other hand, know that for a company to grow, survive, and be successful, they need to engage their entrepreneurial spirit and understand they can't do it all themselves. They need to project a vision for the future of their venture that others can latch onto. They also need to retain several innovative business associates who are enabled to make decisions and implement the leader's vision for the future of the venture. This is not only necessary in order for a company to grow beyond the startup stage, but it's essential for a company to continue to survive long term. So my answer to question number five is, the substantial overlap between entrepreneurs and leaders is in the middle stage of venture development. A venture needs to have both an entrepreneur and entrepreneurial leadership abilities to be successful in the long run. In closing, I guess you can say all of this. All that you are hearing from me this morning, my birth to immigrant parents, my youthful individualism, my education, my years spent in entrepreneurial ventures, and creating both the Uncommon Individual Foundation and Integral Life Sciences, all of it has been somehow guided and directed to this moment. Now, as I stand before you, I don't know whether you think my life has been a success, or whether this path I've taken would be the right one for you. I can only tell you this, it's worth it for me. I now feel as though I'm at least on the road to my personal success, which I define as my self-determined personal happiness. 
The problem I now realize is that as an entrepreneur, I'm never really satisfied. So while I may believe I'm on the road to success, it's not clear to me I will ever arrive at my destination. As you experience the next few days here, I really hope these thoughts and my answers to these questions become meaningful to all of you. If you are not all currently practicing entrepreneurs, you're at least interested in entrepreneurship. So when this week is over, I hope you leave with the inspiration to engage your personal liberty, take control of your life, and if you haven't done so already, become the entrepreneur of the enterprise of your own life by finding, understanding, and releasing the uncommon individual we are all born as and that continues to reside within each of us. If you're interested in learning more about the answers to these questions and how to become the entrepreneur of the enterprise of your own life, go to the Uncommon Individual Foundation website. Thank you all very, very much and enjoy the wonderful experience of being here this week. It's terrific. Thanks so much. Great job.